Open your Bibles to Luke 18. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 9. Luke 18, 9. This, my friends, is the word of the Lord. Let all who have ears now hear. He also told them this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the, the, excuse me, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Thanks be to God for this precious word. Amen. We looked at a story that Jesus told last week, a parable. And this one that we're going to look at today that I just read is very similar. And the main way that it's similar is that it each has two characters, two people in each one of the parables, and they are sharply contrasting people. The one we looked at last week was about a widow and an unjust judge. It was about a marginalized woman, and I told you all about this last week, I ain't going to repeat it, but a marginalized woman who was probably a beggar, who had nothing, <clears throat> and she obviously had no one to uh, speak for her or to come to her defense because she went to this courtroom by herself, and somebody was taking advantage of her. Jesus called him an adversary. And so this marginalized, disenfranchised woman who was put out of society for all intents and purposes went to this judge and pleaded with him for justice. And the judge said no, and she continued to plead with him and plead with him and came back day after day. And Jesus used the words that he kept bothering. She kept bothering him, and she kept beating him down until this unjust judge finally gave in. Jesus said this unjust judge, in sharp contrast to the widow, was a man who did not fear God, and he did not respect or have reverence for image bearers for other people. We know that he was a powerful man, a very educated, learned man, who sat in a seat of power, making decisions about legal disputes and enforcing the law and pronouncing penalties and judgments. And this contrast between this poor defenseless widow in this powerful judge, Jesus was teaching that we ought to pray and never lose heart because eventually the judge said, I'm tired of her bugging me. I'll give her what she wants. And Jesus said, if you keep praying and praying and praying and don't lose heart, what do you think God will do if the unjust judge did that? He will bring justice to earth. In other words, one day, listen church, one day God will set everything right on this earth. The day is coming. He's teaching about the kingdom. That, that theme started back in chapter 17. And he taught that the kingdom is a spiritual kingdom that's in you and in the midst of you. And they wanted to know when it was coming. So he went on to teach that it'll be established on earth when the Son of Man comes. That might be a long time, so don't lose heart. Keep praying. And he told that story and he stays on theme this morning as he tells another story with two contrasting people. One is a Pharisee, one is a tax collector. Now, Pharisees almost always get a bad rap, and they earned it. They deserve the bad rap. There was probably no other group of people that Jesus faced off with and viscerated like he did the Pharisees. They rejected him as their Messiah. They did everything they could to try to catch him in illegal activity or illegal teaching. They were the ones who were largely behind his arrest and crucifixion. 
And so they earned that rap. They were a group of people that were enemies to Messiah and the outworking will of God. They were enemies to that. They resisted that. But I always like to add this. We cannot forget that these were men who had devoted their entire lives to the law of God and to teaching the law of God and to leading the people of God. They sought to listen fastidiously to the minutest details, obey God. They had given their lives to the service of God. And I just believe that many, if not all of them, began with pure motives to be these people who would represent God to his people and become experts in the law and pass that knowledge on to other people. I'm sure a lot of them stayed with that motive throughout the days of Jesus. But a lot of them, if not the majority of them, got off track and became legalists and they loved their position and they became proud and they looked down on other people and they thought they were better and Jesus just constantly took them apart because of it. So there was a Pharisee in this story, but then contrasting him, there was a tax collector, the dregs of society, uh, Roman lackeys, uh, thieves, extortioners. These were men who were hired by the Romans to go around to all of the population and collect taxes, but they didn't just collect taxes. They also took whatever they wanted for themselves. So they made sure that they could deliver to Rome, the Roman government, the taxes that was due them from this particular family, so to speak. But then whatever else they wanted, they took. These were men who were greatly feared and even more greatly hated. Um, they were men who were heartless, who literally took the food off of people's tables. They could care less. They were mobsters. Every home they went to, they gave it a shakedown to get whatever they wanted. So in this story, you see now, in this story is this sharp and wide and clear contrast between a very religious man and a deeply sinful, a man who had given his life vocationally to hurting people and sin. And both of them, Jesus said, went to the temple to pray. That alone is a pretty amazing statement. They went to the temple to pray two, mostly three times. At the times of 12 and 3, and again at 6, there were times of prayer. And Jesus says both of these guys went at the same time to pray. And he says in his story that the Pharisee stood up to pray right in front of everybody, just stood up to pray so that everybody could hear him. <clears throat> and he began to pray thus, God, I am so thankful that I'm not like other people. Not a good start to a prayer, is it? I'm so thankful that I'm not like other people, like these people around me, the unjust and, and, and the extortioners and the adulterers and even this tax collector over here. I'm so glad I'm not like these other people. God, you know, you see it. I fast at least twice a week. I give up food two times a week for you, God, and I always tithe of everything that I get. I never stop. I never hold anything back from you. God, I'm thankful that I am who I am. And then Jesus says the tax collector didn't stand up for everybody to see him, but rather Jesus said he stood off, far off, maybe at the fringe of the crowd. And he couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but bowed his head. And Jesus said, beat his breast. And the only prayer he made was, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that guy, the tax man, went home that day justified. And apparently the Pharisee went home that day just as he came, lost. Now, we really can't feel or appreciate what that first century uh, a Jewish population around Jesus who were listening to that story felt about that. And there are a bunch of Pharisees there, don't forget. 
that the tax collector went home justified, not the Pharisee. Now, there is a main theme to this story, and I know it for sure. My friends, I want to tell you that it's probably not fair to do what I'm about to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'll probably repeat it. You know, if you've heard me preach for a long time, I do it fairly regular. I want to say to you, I don't think there's any more important parable that Jesus told than this one. And I'll probably say that about another one in six weeks. But I for sure, I want to tell you today, I don't know of any other important parable or as important parable as this one. And the lesson that Jesus brings us, there just can't be any more important lesson for every single one of us in this room or watching me online right now. No more important lesson that we have to grapple with. Remember, he's still in the theme. It doesn't look like it, but I'm going to show you. He's still in the theme of the kingdom of God. He's not left that theme with this parable. I know it to be true because next week, Lord willing, we're going to look where all these little kids were running around Jesus and the disciples were saying, get them away from Jesus. And he said, don't get them away from me. Leave these kids here. And unless you have the faith of one of these kids, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. He's still on that theme. And then after that, there's a rich dude that walks up to him and says, how do I get into the kingdom of God? That's just this theme just keeps going in this section of the Gospel of Luke. And it's true here. And the reason I just know that I know that I know what the lesson is, what the theme is, is because it is one word that Jesus speaks in this parable. And it's found in verse 14 where Jesus, talking about the tax man, said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. There it is. Justified. My friends, the reason the lesson of this parable is the most important one you will ever ever have to learn and accept and grapple with is because what Jesus is teaching in this story is how to get into the kingdom of God. And what a person's faith looks like who is in the kingdom of God. And what a person's faith looks like who is not in the kingdom of God. Because he uses this word justified. That's the centerpiece of this whole story. Anything Jesus would have said at that moment, are you with me? Give me an uh uh-huh. Anything Jesus would have said at that moment would have been the centerpiece of the story, the climax, the crescendo right there. If he said that man, the tax man, prayed better than the other guy, then prayer in the right way to pray would have been the most important lesson there. He didn't. He said, this guy, listen, those listening to my story, went home justified. We better understand that word justified. And I want, listen to me, I want so desperately for everyone here to get this. As much as any other time that I have preached. It comes from a Greek word that I'm going to put in a simple definition as I can, that word justified means to have rendered unto you the perfect righteousness that God requires of you. To have rendered unto you the perfect righteousness that God requires of you. Now we've got to understand a couple of words in that definition. First is the word render. We probably know what render means. To render something means to transmit something from one place to another, to transmit it. So you could use this word rendered in this way. This guy was so sick that it rendered him unable to walk. 
So whatever the virus or the sickness that was in him, it transmitted and it sent something to his nerves or whatever else it was that all of a sudden he couldn't walk. The sickness rendered him unable to walk. What this word justified means is that God renders unto you. He gives unto you the righteousness that he requires. Now the other word is righteous. You know what righteous means? Very simply this, is to live in perfect conformity to the life that God has called you to live. Perfect conformity to God in how you think. Perfect conformity to God in how you speak. Perfect conformity to God in the choices you make and how you live your life from day by day by day. That's the righteousness that this word justification means. To be justified by God is to be given or transmitted or to have imputed to you the perfect righteousness that you need to be right with God. Now, there's a question that should be on your mind right now. And if it's not, it just means you need another cup of coffee and need to wake up. There's a question that should be there, and I'm going to put it in street terms. I'm going to put it in street terms. The question that should be there is, how do I score that righteousness then? If that's what it means to be justified, that God gives this righteousness so that I'm right with him, how do I get that righteousness? And I want us to build... Uh, a little bit of a theology of what it means to be justified. No one said more about justification than the Apostle Paul, and he didn't say it more than any other place than in the book of Romans. So we're going to survey a little bit of Romans, so come with me to the book of Romans. You have your Bible? Give me a yep. Go to chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. We're just going to flip through a few chapters here. Romans chapter 2, and you're going to see all of a sudden this picture, this clear, beautiful picture of what it means to be justified come to life here. Romans chapter 2, and look at verse 13. Paul writes, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but it's the doers of the law who will be justified. All right, Paul's setting you up here. What he's saying is, it's not those who hear the will of God, the law of God, that get this righteousness, but it's rather those who do it, who obey it, who obey the law perfectly. They're the ones who end up justified. Now listen, it's not those who hear it, but it's those who perfectly obey the law of God. They end up with this righteousness. They end up justified. Now, look over at chapter 3 and verse 23. Now he writes this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, watch, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And now you say, a gift? You just said over there, I had to obey in order to get this righteousness. I had to do the law in order to get this righteousness. And now you're saying it's a gift? Well, look up the page of chapter 3, verse 20. Here's where he really pulls a fast one. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes a knowledge of sin. You see what he said? You say, Paul, you just said to be justified, you have to obey the law. Then you say it's a gift. Then you say by obeying the law, no one can be justified. What are you saying, Paul? You know what he's saying as he's setting you up in chapter 2? Here's what he's saying. If you could obey the law perfectly, you'd be justified. But then he's saying this, but you can't. Nobody can. You never will. Try as you might. You'll never obey God perfectly. I hope that this doesn't need preached to you. 
If there's anyone out there who thinks, yes, I can, or yes, I am, that will, well, we'll talk to your wife. <laughs> we'll talk to your husband. Because Paul just wants to sort of raise something up to set you up. If you can obey the law perfectly, you'll be justified. But by obeying the law, no one is justified because you can't. To be justified, you have to know that it's a gift of grace from God. He gives it to you free, a gift. Now look at verse number 28 in chapter 3, 328. This is where we're going to start answering the question, how do I score this? For we hold that one is justified by, say it church, apart from the works of the law. There you go. How do I receive this free gift of grace of being justified and, and righteous before God, the perfect righteousness that he requires? How does that happen to me? You believe. You have faith in Jesus Christ. And through that faith in Jesus Christ, when you put your faith in Christ Jesus, he renders, he transmits, he imputes the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ on you. Now listen, this is important, and this doesn't need to be preached either. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're going to be righteous practically from day by day by day. Hopefully a little more like it, but it doesn't mean that. He's just giving you, rendering you the, the, the righteousness, clothes you in it so that when he sees you, he sees the perfect righteousness of his son. This is a declaration. It actually is a legal declaration where the guilty sinner stands before the judge and God says, innocent. Righteous because of my son Jesus Christ. Righteous. That's a great place to say amen. Somebody say amen. <laughs> now look at chapter 4, verse 5 of Romans. And to the one who does not work, in other words, to the one who gets this and knows they can't obey enough, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, it is his faith that is counted as righteousness. That's the operative word for receiving the gift of God. We do nothing but simply hold out our hands and say, I believe in Jesus. I trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. I can't be good enough to get to you. I can't be made right with you without Jesus. To the one who believes is made right with God. Let me show you that in chapter 5, verse 1. Check this out. Here's a great statement. Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Before you being justified, you're God's enemy. You're not reconciled to God. You're not close to God. You're not a friend of God. There's enmity between you and God. But when through your faith the free gift of the grace of salvation comes to you and you are justified, declared righteous, then all of a sudden all that goes and there's peace between you and God. That's the best news you'll hear all day. Even after the Bengals win, that's still the best news. Look at chapter 5, verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified, watch, by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him through the wrath of God. If you ever wanted to know, how is it that faith works with God? How is it that that's what he's looking for from me is to believe and receive. How is that? It's the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus only. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's it. On the cross, when he spilled his blood out the lacerations on his back and the, the crown on his forehead and the spearing and the spikes, when that happened, 
in that blood when someone takes and puts their faith in Jesus Christ and that sacrifice because he bled and died for you in your sins you are eternally set free from those sins and forgiven and given the righteousness of Jesus Christ that my friends is what it means to be justified that's it now back to the tax man back to the tax man because we're told in verse 14 that after he prayed, Jesus said, that's the one who went home justified. What's he saying? What he's saying is what he just prayed. Now listen, so important. What he just prayed showed a faith in God that brought about the free grace and gift of God, and he received his justification. That, that prayer showed this faith. And as we just saw what Paul wrote in Romans, that faith was his justification. So when Jesus says, when I saw that, that man went home free of his sin and forgiven of all of them, justified by grace as a free gift through that faith that you saw that came out of him in that prayer. Now here's the thing. Both of these guys had faith. They both did. Now if I had time, I'd develop that whole thing, but let me just suffice to say this. They both went to the temple to pray. You don't go to the temple and pray if you don't believe in God. Both of them believed in God. Both of them had a faith in God. They both went to the temple to pray. But I guess what we're learning here in the story that Jesus told is that, listen, there's these two species of faith. And there are. This is vital. This is important for your soul's well-being. Are you with me? Give me a yep. yep. Two species of faith. One faith is damning. And one faith is saving. Remember what James wrote in his letter? Oh, you say you believe in God? The demons believe in God. There's that species of faith that is damning. But there's a species of faith that places all trust and all belief in all of the life in the risen Christ that saves. And Jesus showed us some characteristics of each one of these faiths. And I think it's important to see. And I'm praying that the faith that you have, that you see, is the saving faith and not the damning faith. So let's think for a minute about the Pharisees' faith. What in his faith, he showed us these characteristics of damning faith. Here comes the first one. The first one that he um, demonstrated is that he trusted in himself. That's just what Luke wrote clearly in verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves. What that means essentially is that this Pharisee was trying to justify himself. He wasn't interested in the justification, the free gift of grace and justification that comes from God. He tried to justify himself. And he did, didn't he? What did he do? He stood up and in order to justify himself before people around him, he said, I'm not like these people. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a tax collector. Just justify myself. I tithe. I fast. Trying to justify himself before God. I've earned this. I've obeyed enough. I'm a good guy. This happened throughout the Gospels. Once a lawyer came up to Jesus and tried to trick him and tried to catch him in a theological quandary. And he said to Jesus, hey, what's the most important law in all of the scriptures? And Jesus looks back at him and says, you're a smart guy, Mr. Lawyer. Tell me what the law says. And the guy says, well, 
It says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's right. Do it, and you'll live. Knowing that he couldn't do it. And then the text tells us this. And trying to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who's my neighbor then? See, he wanted to see if he had that down pat. Who's my neighbor? I'm justifying myself here. Who's my neighbor? I know he was hoping that Jesus might say something like, well, it starts with your family and then works in concentric circles out to your neighbors and then to your friend group and then to people you work with. And if he heard Jesus say something like that, he'd say, I got that. Justified himself. I got that. But he didn't. That's where Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Got him. I mean, got him. Um, you remember the prodigal son? We looked at that weeks and weeks ago. The, the parable of the prodigal son. Remember the older brother? Even though the word justified wasn't used, it's exactly what he did is tried to self-justify himself because he was so mad at his dad for giving the free get grace of the gift of a party and a welcoming back, right? What are you doing giving this guy a party? This slug son of yours. I can't believe you're doing this after everything that he's done to you. And here comes the self-justification. You've not even given me a scrawny goat for a party. And I've worked for you faithfully. I've never taken a day off. I've never left you. I've never taken advantage of you. Justifying himself. I've earned that. He didn't earn that. You can't give that gift like that. You can't show that grace. What about me? You know what, my friends? This is what people everywhere continue to do today, is to justify themselves rather than come by faith to the justification that only God can give. Here's an example. I bet you've heard this. I've heard it a lot. You go to someone and you say to them, you think you're going to heaven someday when you die? And a lot of times they say, well, I hope so. I think so. And then you say, why do you think that? Why do you think you're going to go to heaven? And then the self-justification starts. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I've lived a decent life, not perfect, I'm only human, but I help little old ladies across the street, I give kids candy, I, I don't steal, I never murdered anyone. I'm a pretty good person. Let me justify myself before you and why I think I have earned heaven. This is the plight of unsaved man. This is the characteristic of damning faith. Because that person might say to you, of course I believe in God. There's a faith there. It's a damning faith. I've been pretty good. And that's what this Pharisee is doing. Look what he does. He compares himself to tax collectors and adulterers and unjust people and, and, and immoral people. When we self-justify, that's what we do. Haven't killed anybody. Haven't raped anybody. I've never stolen anything. Now listen, I'll say something a little shocking. Comparing is not a bad thing. You ought to compare. But compare right. The only right comparison is to God who is perfectly holy and says, be ye holy as I am holy. There's your comparison. So the characteristic of this damning faith is that you try to, you try to justify yourself. You trust your, in, in other people. The other thing verse 9 tells us, and here comes the second characteristic of damning faith, is this. Um, this Pharisee treated other people with contempt. That's the word Luke uses, with contempt. Means he looked down on them, means he despised them. And my friends, 
please, please listen and listen deeply to this. A characteristic of damning faith is when someone looks down on someone else with contempt. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid for the American church. And I want you to know, let me say this parenthetically, I love the American church. I have been involved with and served vocationally the American church for over three decades. I love the church, but I know the church. And I'm afraid that we have normalized contempt and greatly minimized love. We, we have no problem despising someone who thinks differently than we do, who are on the other side of the political aisle, who are making decisions that are hurting this country. And they are. They are. But we despise them for it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, I can't stand that guy. I can't stand that lady. And the church has become this place where we've normalized picking sins. Picking a sin. And that person lives that kind of sin that I hate and I can't stand them. I just can't stand them because of it. And we look down in contempt on other people rather than love them. We're never called to, to look at people with contempt and to speak contemptuously against other people. Disagree with how they live and what they think and how they vote and on and on. But the person, the image-bearing person, deserves your love because you have been loved. I think the church needs to repent of these things. We need to turn away from these things. Francis Schaeffer said, and this is a, an electric quote, Francis Schaeffer said, if the world does not see us loving, they deserve and have the right to call us unbelievers, non-Christians. The characteristic of damning faith is to look on others with contempt. Here's a powerful statement made about Jesus. He ate with sinners. That's amazing. I got to move on because I'm going to be a little late. But let me just say this. That eating with people in the first century especially, that was a very intimate time of fellowship. You didn't eat with just anyone. And you know what Jesus did? He went in for times of intimate fellowship. Listen to me now with people who were joyfully and gladly living lives that were the reason he was about to die. Put that in your pipe and smoke it later. Here's one more, and that is, um, I, I, this is going to sound weird, so listen to how I say it, then hear my explanation. Uh, a characteristic of damning faith, this Pharisee prayed with himself. He prayed with himself. And all I can do now is point it out, but I want you to see it. Um, look at verse number 11. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed. Now here's how that is in the Greek text. The Pharisee, by himself, prayed with himself. That's the way the King James puts it. The Pharisee thus with himself prayed. What's that mean? What that means is this. What the Pharisee essentially did, listen church, was when he stood to pray, he gave a tip of the cap to God and then he went on with a self-oriented monologue. He wasn't praying. I love what one commentator said. His prayer shows him that shows us that he was completely stoned on himself. <laughs> and he was. I got some characteristics of saving faith, and I'm going to give them because I'm not stretching this one in the next week. Number one, 
We see this in the tax man. He had a clear God-oriented fear and contrition of God. He had this clear God-oriented fear and contrition. This guy could not even look to heaven where God was enthroned. He couldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but kept his head bowed and beat his breast over his sin and said, have mercy on me, beat his breast. That sign from the first century of great brokenness and sadness and grief. We only see someone beating their breast one other place in the New Testament. And it's when Jesus was hanging on the cross, right at the end of his life, when he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he said, it is finished, breathed his last, and died. And the centurion said, surely this man was innocent of all these things. And then the Bible tells us that in the darkness of that afternoon, people who were present turned and walked to their homes, beating their breasts over what they just witnessed. Here's a characteristic of saving faith is a brokenness over your sin, a brokenness. Secondly, a characteristic I see is that this tax man had a clear understanding of really what was wrong with him. He said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He knew what was wrong with him. He didn't say it was mama's fault. He didn't say it was daddy's fault. He said, I'm a sinner. To sin is to transgress the holiness of God. It is to rebel against the will of God, the heart of God. It is to enthrone yourself and do what you want, when you want, however you want, and disregard God. And all of us are sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all born completely depraved. No one has to teach us to sin. We're given to live in our lives how we want to live our lives. We're sinful. And this man knew that was his issue. He knew that was his issue. You might have a lot of issues in life, and they're serious, and you need, to, you need to address them. But I'm telling you, if you don't ever dig down and see this, then you're going to miss what is really wrong with you and me in this world. You dig down in your heart to the bottom where there's one ugly, gnarled root, and it's sin. And he knew that. This, this is a characteristic of saving faith. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And lastly, this characteristic of saving faith that I see in this guy is that he knew exactly what he really needed. Mercy. That's all. I need your mercy. There's nothing I can do. The Greek word translated mercy is not the usual one that's translated mercy. This one means to propitiate. There's your $5 word for the day. To propitiate. And to propitiate means to have the guilt and shame of your sin removed from you. The wrath and fury of God over your sin removed from you. You know what he's saying? God, forgive me for my sins. Take away my sins. Take away my guilt. Take away my shame. Deliver me from your wrath. Propitiate my sins. Be merciful to me. Oh, that's what saving faith is. So, I just can't let you go without asking you, Where'd you see yourself? What kind of faith do you have? If it's stirring in you right now and you know, mm, I don't see myself in that saving faith, would you just not leave here until you express that to God and be like the tax man and just say, have mercy on me, a sinner. I believe you. I trust Jesus. I thank you for the blood. Take a moment and bow your heads and close your eyes and just do that if you need to.